reason why I call it radical is that it's very rare. And when I'm talking about respect, there's, there's actually two definitions of respect. One is, is about earning respect for some sort of skill. And that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is the second definition of respect, which is about the regard, the unconditional regard that we owe each other for each other's emotions, for each other's experiences in life, for, for, for our shared humanity. And that's the kind of unconditional respect that I'm talking about with radical respect. How do we get to that kind of unconditional radical respect? Uh, I think there, there are two conditions that are important. You know me, I love a good two by two framework. One is that we need to optimize for collaboration, not coercion. We need to create, I, I believe that hierarchy is important when we're getting things done as a team. And so we have roles to play, but we need a, a, a kind of hierarchy that optimizes for collaboration and doesn't coerce people, doesn't, doesn't try to force people uh, to do things. And then the other, uh, so that's the vertical line. The horizontal line is we need to honor everyone's individuality. We cannot demand conformity if we want to get to this kind of radical respect. And it's kind of I mean, what could, what could, why don't we always have that? Because I think we all want that kind of environment where the strength of the team is the individual and the strength of the individual is the team. One of the things that I write about in Radical Respect is that if you are a leader and you don't design your management systems to be fair, if you don't design checks and balances into every stage of the employee life cycle, if you don't quantify bias at every stage of the employee life cycle, you're going to get systemic injustice every single time. HR has an incredibly important role to play. And I think HR is, is in a difficult situation because the very often what happens is that leaders over delegate solving these problems to HR. And that makes it impossible to solve the problem. So, so one of the things that, that HR can do is they can equip their leaders to, to understand what they can do about bias, prejudice, and bullying. So leaders themselves have got to teach their teams to, to disrupt bias when they notice it in the meeting. HR cannot be in every team meeting. <laughs> that happens. Uh, the teams don't want that. HR doesn't want that. I think we can all agree that, would, that that is not a desired outcome. And therefore, leaders have got to teach their teams to disrupt bias when it happens in a meeting. Whatever it is, figure out what's the word or phrase that you all are going to use when you notice something biased being said or done. I don't think that uh, you meant that the way that it sounded. Is a, a, An I statement is an excellent response to bias because an I statement sort of holds a mirror up and, and helps everybody notice what happened. They don't mean it, so they'll knock it off when they realize it, hopefully. So that's one thing that HR can do. HR can also encourage leaders to, to sit down with their team and to figure out what to do when prejudice uh, happens in a meeting when they notice somebody saying or doing something prejudiced because holding up a mirror, waving a purple flag, whatever it is, is not going to work if it is prejudice because the other person's going to grin and yeah, they're going to like what they see. And so you need an it statement in the case of prejudice. An it statement can appeal to the law, it can appeal to a company policy, or it can appeal to common sense. And so HR needs to make sure that the policies that the company has come up with to prevent one person, I mean, one person is free to believe whatever they want, but they can't impose those beliefs on others. And that's really what the it statement is pointing out. And HR can make sure that everybody understands what the policies are, but then they've got to encourage the team to create space for conversation. Very few of us want to, to be seen as a jerk. And so very often we pull our punches. We don't say the thing that needs to be said because we're afraid of hurting the other person's feelings or we're afraid of offending them or we're afraid that there'll be some repercussion if we say the thing. 
The other part of what's going on is that I'm worried about my reputation in some way, shape, or form. And so I don't want to, I, I, don't, I, I don't want to say the thing because I'm afraid that it'll have some kind of, people won't like me or whatever. It'll have some kind of negative repercussion on, on my reputation. And that's ruin of sympathy and manipulative insincerity. And so being aware of when that, those kind of behaviors are, are tempting me not to say the thing helps give, prompt me to say the thing that needs to be said.